Now, uh, this uh, afternoon, uh, it's a kind of special lecture I'm giving. And I gave a very, very similar lecture to that, and that's my first slide, because that's the title of, of my talk. And I gave a, a somewhat similar talk to this one in, in China, in Guangzhou, uh, the uh, third largest city in China with a population of 20 million uh, earlier this year. And it generated a very good discussion, actually. So I, I hope that this may also be the case. So it's a kind of strange uh, lecture. It's a kind of hybrid. It's not a real scientific lecture because it's structured around m my life and my life course as a science uh, person who produces science and publishes science. And so there's a kind of mixture of my personal life and uh, some of the science. Of course, only glimpses of it because, as Peter says, I have maybe published a little bit too many papers, so of course not possible to talk about 379 papers uh, as Peter has counted them up in, 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 in one lecture. So, let's proceed. So, as Peter already mentioned, uh, I am a sort of genetically uh, half Hungarian. But unfortunately, I have to say, I do not speak Hungarian, uh, for which I have to blame my mother, who uh, never taught me Hungarian. But uh, as Peter already said, my mother was a, a classical concert pianist, and, and you see her there in that picture. And uh, you also see her program, actually, for her debut concert here in uh, Budapest in 1934, a very classical uh, concert program with the classical uh, composers. Her main teacher at the Liszt Conservatory was actually not Bartok, but Bartok, amazingly enough, came to this concert and uh, found some interest in my mother and offered her to teach her for some years, uh, which she did, and for which he took no payment actually following a tradition of the great Franz Liszt, who taught masses of students during his life and never asked for honorary or for any of his teaching, actually. So Bartok followed that line. Now, there's a science link here, which is a bit interesting, because Bartok, and that may surprise many of you, uh, Bartok Bela was actually a member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and uh, had actually an office in this building for uh, part of his life, because he was not only a composer, of course, he was actually a professional musical historian who searched for the origins of Hungarian uh, folk music. And so this was a very important part of his life. So he was a member of this academy, and uh, in that sense there is a direct link to me, I'm happy to say, because some years ago I was elected a member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, for which I'm uh, very uh, happy, of course. So there's an interesting link here between uh, music and uh, science. My first visit to Hungary uh, happened in 1948, but uh, I was only five years old, so I don't have a particularly good recollection of that time, but that was actually what uh, this part of Budapest looked like uh, still in 1948. But my family uh, understood this, of course, and uh, so I had a memory of it in the sense that it was frequently discussed in our family, the state of Budapest, at that particular uh, time. There's also an interesting link, which I only discovered later, between my own interest and Seket. Naturally, uh, being a son of a classical pianist, I had a great interest in classical music. And one of my great heroes in my uh, teenage years and also later was the great uh, Hungarian conductor, uh, Franz Fritschoy. And he uh, actually uh, was here in Seget, uh, the chief conductor at the uh, opera in Seget for, 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 for many years. And there's an interesting little detail of his life. In uh, 1938, there was some kind of disagreement between uh, Fritschoy and the city authorities about funding, as often happens uh, in, in these matters, and Fritscher is threatened to leave Seget at that point. And uh, Albert San Giorgi took an interest in this matter and led a delegation to the mayor of Seget 
saying to the mayor, you know, you need to do something because this is a really outstanding conductor and we cannot afford to lose uh, such a great man. And indeed, uh, Fritjoy continued to stay uh, here in Seget. And if you visit the National Theatre here in Seget, you will find this plaque here, which commemorates uh, Fritjoy's years here as conductor uh, in, in, in Seget. He then went to Budapest and uh, in the uh, late 40s, uh, by some accident that often happens, uh, a very famous conductor, Otto Klemperer, uh, fell ill, and Fritjoy was asked to conduct at the Salzburg Festival. And that actually was the opening of a very great career for him, and he became a very, very big uh, name worldwide, uh, particularly in, in Germany, where he held some of the most important positions in musical life, but sadly, he died very early at, at the age of 48. Still, you will find very many of his uh, recordings uh, there. You will see on the internet, you will find him. And uh, he was probably, in my view, the greatest interpreter of the music of Bartok and, and Mozart uh, in, in, in his time. So a nice link here between Seget uh, uh, in science and in the arts. Now, in spite of uh, actually I am a somewhat unusual scientist, I should say, because at school I was not terribly interested in science, actually. My main interests were in the humanities, in literature, and in music, and uh, this is probably quite unusual. So uh, I entered university with very bad motivation, actually. I just thought, okay, Korean medicine is good, you are sure to get a good job. And uh, that was actually my motivation, not that I wanted to save people's lives or something. I just thought this is a, a very good uh, career, and my parents did not complain. And uh, until my second year, actually, uh, I had the astonishing luck to get a very, very good tutor in physiology, Christian Krone. He was a very inspiring, a very, very intelligent man, and also actually a man of great culture. He, I met him again and again at concerts in Copenhagen in those years because he was always there at the important events. But, uh, and also a politically very interesting person, very left-wing, as was often the case with intellectuals in those days. Uh, he was actually for some time a member of the Communist Party, I have to say, and could not actually travel to the US. Because in those days, if you had ever been a member of the Communist Party, you would not be allowed into the US. But he was an inspiring teacher, and if it was not for him, I probably today might be a general practitioner, and I would probably not, uh, not, not stand here. I never worked with him, actually, because I never had a supervisor, but he was the person who made me see that physiology is really great science, and uh, it's interesting. Now, through various accidents that I don't have time to discuss here, uh, during my undergraduate period, I got an interest in the exocrine glands, so this is just a very simple scheme of the digestive system, and by some strange accident, I start working on salivary glands. So again, you may see and may feel that my level of ambition was rather limited, because uh, my aim at that point was simply to understand how salivary secretion worked. And you may say, well, what does that matter? I mean, isn't there some ridiculous small glands sitting here in the mouse, and why should anybody care about uh, how they work? But somehow, there was a kind of black spot in the textbook. Nothing was said about the mechanisms whatsoever. And yet, it occurred to me that we have these glands, and as soon as you eat, masses of saliva pours out in the mouse, and if it didn't happen, it would actually be quite unpleasant. It would not be able to <laughs> uh, digest things. And uh, nobody seemed to know much about how the salivary secretion was switched on and how it was switched off. So uh, I decided that uh, that's actually what I'm going to, to work on. And so I, I started this work, and I actually started this work together with a fellow a uh, medical student in exactly the same year as me, Jan Hilmark Paulsen. So the two of us just decided that we were actually going to do some experimental work. And uh, again, I don't have to go into the details at this point in time. It was an extraordinary time in the period, so there wasn't much control with anything that happened in the university. So basically, we just occupied a laboratory without asking anybody, actually. And we assembled some equipment from different parts, and, and we started doing experiments. And we actually published uh, quite a few papers in the, what at that time was a very respectable journal. Uh, 
the actor physiologist in Scandinavia, four papers in 1967. And uh, at that point, actually, when we started our work, very little was known, as I said, about the salary gram, but there was a theory about how it worked. And uh, that is encapsulated in this very simple scheme here. So this is a functional unit of an exocrine gland. And uh, fluid is produced going into this, what we call a lumen. And that goes into the ducts. Small ducts merge the big ducts. And finally, there's a big excretory duct that delivers the saliva into the mouse. And uh, a Swedish neuroscientist, actually, for a little while worked on the salivary glands as a kind of side project. And he had this idea that what happened was that the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, as a chemical substance released from nerve endings around the uh, ACNR cells in the salivary glands, and would directly activate an energy requiring pump that would pump chloride into the cells. So chloride is a negative ion that would attract sodium ions, he reasoned, and then water would have to follow. The cells would swell, the pressure would increase, and water would be filtered into the lumen. That was his theory for how uh, secretion works. And initially, we were quite impressed. We, of course, were totally inexperienced. We had no, uh, actually, we didn't really have a mentor either at that point. And so we thought this was great, and we did some various experiments that seemed to not contradict this, and they were, as I say, readily uh, published. However, at some point, uh, we began to sort of say, well, maybe we should think about whether this really is correct, actually. So one of the basic findings was that when you activate cells with acetylcholine, then the membrane potential changes. So uh, the cells become more negative inside, and that's what we call a hyperpolarization. The membrane potential basically increases. And that's what it looks like. So if you look at an actual record, it's one of the early records we made, then you see there's a rather low membrane potential. You add acetylcholine, and then the membrane potential increases. So that was supposed to be due to this uptake of chloride ions. However, we did a very simple experiment. Uh, we replaced all chloride in the fluid going into the salivary gland with a big anion sulfate. And the reason that it would be unlikely that such a big anion would be transported by the same system as chloride. And indeed, what we observed was that the salivary secretion was knocked out completely. So the gland could not produce saliva in the absence of chloride. But, as you see here, the hyperpolarization persisted completely normally. That was actually the very first experiment we made worked, actually. So we said to ourselves, well, there's probably something wrong with uh, the theory that uh, Lomberg had produced. However, we were, of course, totally unknown undergraduate students without any kind of, uh, uh, shall we say, credentials scientifically. And I remember I gave a seminar in this uh, uh, medical uh, physiology department in Copenhagen at that time about our new uh, uh, data. And this was a general reaction, as you see up there. A lot of people said to themselves, you know, these two students, I mean, uh, and do they really think that they have disproved what a famous professor ha has, has done? And Anders Lundberg had very big credentials because he had worked for several years with John Eccles in Canberra in Australia. John Eccles was a Nobel Prize winner in 1963. So this was a person who had numerous publications together with the Nobel laureate. And then we were saying that uh, this was completely wrong. And actually, this is another interesting experience that may interest some of you, because as I said, we published a lot of unimportant papers quite easily. But this paper here, which actually was important, was rejected by the journal. And you can, of course, easily guess why. Uh, and so that was the fate. At that time, actually, I didn't have time to pursue it much more because uh, there was a degree of pressure from my parents. People said, you know, you are doing all these experiments, but you're still an undergraduate. Maybe you should take your final exam now, finally. And so uh, I felt obliged, actually, to stop the experimental work and finally read all the clinical books, which I had totally neglected, actually, during that period. Uh, so we just, in order to get it published, we published it in a journal that I'm not even sure whether it exists anymore, uh, quite an unimportant journal, but we just felt it has to be published somehow. But uh, in that sense, 
it was a kind of hard lesson that it is not necessarily the case that when you actually find something important that it is immediately recognized. But anyway, I passed my exam to the big surprise of my parents because I had basically not done much work during the clinical years. And uh, a piece of luck there was, this was a time when in many universities in the world, but in Copenhagen in particular, the number of medical students just increased dramatically in a very short period of time. So there were no teachers actually. So those people who had uh, done something would immediately be appointed to the, uh, to the staff. So I got a permanent position actually immediately after graduation in 69 and I was a lecturer at the university and I realized that obviously I needed to pursue this to really persuade people and that I had to publish something in journals that actually were uh, acknowledged as important journals. And I managed actually very quickly to publish two papers in what was at that time and is still today a very important journal, the British Journal of Physiology. And I published two papers there early 1970s. And then I had this amazing luck, which really impressed people in Copenhagen at that time. Suddenly I got an invitation from the Royal Society in London to speak at an important conference, uh, which was organized by uh, Richard Keynes, uh, a close associate of uh, Alan Hodgkin who won a Nobel Prize in 1963 for his discoveries regarding the conduction of the nervous impulse. Uh, Alan Hodgkin had actually become president of the Royal Society in that year. And uh, in this sort of curious way in the British world, only the foreign speakers at that meeting were invited to a dinner in uh, the president's flat, which still to this day is here at the very top of the Royal Society in London. So this is still where the Royal Society is in London. And of course, at that time, I never expected that I would eventually be elected a fellow of that, but that did happen many, many years later. So anyway, I was invited to this dinner at the eve, and I was even sitting next to Lady Hodgkin, who was actually American, a very nice uh, person. So this meeting was, in a way, a breakthrough uh, for me. It was a kind of recognition that it was important, and uh, all the proceedings from that meeting were published in the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society which actually was a pioneer journal because that was the first journal that published in English. So up to the Royal Society, as I've written there, is quite old. It was established in 1660, and the journal was established a few years later. Up to that point, all scientific work was published in Latin. And uh, the Philosophic Foundation broke with that tradition and started publishing in English. So that may seem to you now uh, that that was a good thing. In some ways it was not a good thing because it started the period of nationalism in science publishing because so British scientists published in English uh, but German scientists published in German. And for many years, of course, uh, German science was incredibly strong. In, in the 19th century and the early 20th century, actually, German science was the strongest in the world. And so German journals were very, very important in that point. So in a sense, there was a kind of dispersion of science and nobody had the common language uh, anymore. And up to 1933, uh, uh, German science was uh, predominant actually. It was actually, one has to admit, more important than, than, than British science uh, at that point in time. However, of course, and that's just a little bit of a digression, but I do think it's an important point to make, just to go away from the story for, for a brief moment, because many people think that German science was destroyed by the war, but that's actually not. German science was destroyed before the war. It was destroyed from in the period between 1933 and 1939. In six years where there was peace and where many people thought that Germany was doing great, but politically, of course, it was a disaster. And what is not well remembered by many people is that something that 40% of university professors in Germany left Germany, not because of the war, but because of the politics in Germany. So it's a salutary reminder to all of us that uh, politics uh, can really matter, and German science, of course, never recovered from that loss. Anyway, that's a bit of a diversion. So anyway, I, in these papers here, I could show that the hyperpolarization was actually due to opening of uh, potassium channels. 
So it was not chloride moving in, it was potassium moving out, which of course electrically means the, the same thing. However, the final proof that this was the way it worked only came many, many years after the patch clamp technique, and I will uh, come back to that in a moment. So at this point in time, I will make a small break and give a kind of mini tutorial because that becomes important in order to understand what comes up. So it's just a few minutes of what happens to calcium inside cells. So the concentration of free calcium ions inside cell is really low. So in the resting situation, about 0.1 micromolar. So it's 10 to minus 7 moles per liter. It's very, very, very low, very few free calcium ions, actually. Outside, much, much higher. In the solution outside cells, uh, the free ionized calcium concentration is about 1 millimolar. And there is a store in almost all cells, except red blood cells, which do not have this organelle, but in all nucleated cells, there is a store inside cells, uh, in most cells, called the endoplasmic reticulum, and there's a calcium pump, and again, this store has a calcium concentration of roughly about one millimole per liter. So you can see that you can create a calcium signal, as we call it, a signal meaning a sudden sharp rise in the calcium concentration inside the cytoplasm here, either by opening up channels permeable to calcium in the cell membrane, or by opening up channels permeable to calcium here in this calcium store in the endoplasmic reticulum. In nerve cells, the most important route to create calcium signals are special calcium channels that are voltage gated, as we say, so if you depolarize the membrane, these channels will open up and calcium will flow in, and that's how neurotransmitters are secreted from nerve endings. However, outside the nerve system and outside the muscle system, calcium signals are mostly initiated by a release of calcium from inside this store. And again, you have this big gradient, so a small number of calcium ions can make a huge change to this calcium concentration. And uh, this system is quite important for the cells that I will talk about, namely the exocrine gland cells. But here is another twist of the story that the release of calcium from this store will secondarily open up another type of calcium channel, this plasma membrane, so that calcium will flow into the cell. Now, for many years, there was a kind of suspicion that also fluid secretion from exocrine glands was somewhat calcium dependent, but the results were not always very clear. So we, we, we had to look into this. And during a sabbatical in, in Cambridge, uh, where I spent a year in the Department of Pharmacology, uh, we did experiments where we looked at the movement of radioactive calcium uh, in gland cells. So in pieces of uh, pancreatic pieces, we loaded the glands up with radioactive calcium. We stimulated the cells, and we could see that immediately there was a huge liberation of radioactive calcium. And very shortly after that, secretion started. So this is just one of the many enzymes that is secreted from uh, the pancreas. So this uh, very simple uh, experiment, uh, which was published in the Journal of Physiology in 1973, again, the authors were in alphabetical order, and in fact, the first author, Keith Matthews, uh, was basically away from Cambridge the whole of the year on sabbatical in another place, but because it was his laboratory, he was included there, and he became, because of the way the Journal of Physiology insisted on authorship, he became the first author of this paper. Anyway, uh, the suggestion was that you get some release of calcium from internal stores, and that triggers secretion. And actually, that turned out to be uh, the right interpretation. Other experiments, which we did a bit later, was done on an isolated, perfused pancreas, where we stimulate secretion by the hormone cholecystokinin. So there are two major stimulants of enzyme secretion from the pancreas, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and the hormone peptide hormone cholecystokinin. And they both uh, produce the same result, actually. So you get a marked increase in fluid secretion, 
and a marked increase in enzyme secretion. But when you then remove calcium from the solution flowing into the glands, but you continue the stimulation, you see that the fluid secretion and the enzyme secretion collapse almost immediately. So clearly, calcium is important. However, the initiation of secretion is completely independent of external calcium. So this experiment can be repeated in a complete absence of calcium, and you get exactly the same result. So it would appear that you have an initial secretion that is triggered by a release of calcium, and that the sustained secretion depends on a continuing inflow of, 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 of calcium. And this is a picture taken many years later. Uh, just to point out, uh, Sezuro Ibashi was actually the person who discovered the calcium storing organelle function uh, in the cells. Uh, he's one amongst many people that Peter Hege mentioned before who deserved the Nobel Prize but didn't get it actually, but it was a really uh, key discovery because without that discovery one could not understand how calcium signaling act actually works. So this was actually a celebration of his 70th birthday in Okazaki in uh, 93. Now I, as Peter Hecke also mentioned, moved to the University of Dundee in 1975. Uh, I was uh, quite young at the time. In fact, I was the youngest member of staff when I became the head of the department. So it was quite a steep learning curve. But there was a better grant system in the UK than in Denmark, so I could have a larger group, and we managed to work on a very great number of different exocrine glands. And uh, then it became clear also why uh, Lundberg had been wrong, actually, because it was not the case that all exocrine glands experience the hyperpolarization when you stimulate them. Some glands uh, had a depolarization initially. And a detailed ionic analysis, which I don't have the time to go into, indicated that in all uh, gland cells, when you stimulate them, there is an opening of two types of channels, chloride channels and potassium channels. And a little bit dependent on the balance of these things, you can get a depolarization or you can get a hyperpolarization. But that only became clear when we actually had uh, looked at a number of uh, different uh, gland cells. So then, uh, what was the most important achievement uh, in the years in Dundee was actually my very first PhD student, because we didn't have a PhD system in Denmark, actually, so I never had a PhD student before I came to Dundee. And uh, Noyuki Iwasuki, who came to me from Japan, he was a surgeon, actually, by training, and had no scientific training, but was interested, curious, as we heard before, and uh, it turned out to be a tremendous person who published an enormous number of papers in his PhD product. But this is his really most important paper, which was published in Nature in 1977. And that actually gave us a link between calcium signaling and the electrophysiology. So it was a really important paper, although to my sorrow, it's not actually one of my very highly cited papers, but I think it was actually a very important paper. And that was the first time that we actually could see what we were doing. This may seem very strange to you, but in those days, uh, microscopy was not always so great. So up to that point, all our work had been blind, basically. We stuck a microelectrode into the gland, and we knew that most of the cells were ASNA cells, and so we assumed that most of the recordings were from the ASNA cells, and that indeed turned out to be correct. But we could not actually see what we were doing. So uh, we got a very good microscope here with a long working distance, a mirror objective. And for the first time, we could actually see the individual ASNA cells. And you can see the, the nuclei here. And here you see the intracellular microelectrodes. This is still the days of the so-called sharp microelectrodes. You puncture a cell with a microelectrode, and you measure the actual potential difference between the cell interior and the outside. And one of the discoveries that Noriko Iwasuke made was that these ASNA cells in one unit are very tightly coupled, actually. So they almost work like one cell. And uh, we now know that there are masses of the so-called gap junctions that link cells together. And uh, you can see it directly here, a very nice experiment that Noriko did, injecting a fluorescent probe into one cell. And you can see how the fluorescent probe 
has moved to neighboring cells quite quickly. You can actually, under the microscope, while you do the experiment, you can see the dye moving into the neighboring cells. So this meant that we could deal with such a unit as if it was one cell. And so the really nice experiment he did was to fill one electrode with the traditional solution, uh, potassium chloride, just as a conductor, but the other electrode was filled with a calcium chloride solution. And finally, we could stimulate the cells locally with a pipette full of acetylcholine chloride, so acetylcholine is positively charged, and by making the inside of that pipette positive, you can eject acetylcholine onto the surface of the cell. That's a very nice technique. So here you see the initial part of the experiment. You stimulate with acetylcholine, and both these two cells show a depolarization. So this is not a salivary gland now, this is a mouse pancreas, where the chloride channels predominate, so you have a depolarization. Then we switch the calcium injection electrode away from a recording electrode and make it into an in injection electrode. And at these signals here, we inject calcium into this cell. And you see now, you get signals exactly similar to the action of acetylcholine on the outside. So what the imp important point that the paper made was that you can actually mimic the action of acetylcholine from the outside of the cell by increasing the calcium concentration inside the cell. And so we had already the understanding of how these electrical changes occur, the primary event is actually a change in the calcium concentration, and that causes the opening of the ion channels, which actually then triggers the fluid secretion. However, uh, my period in uh, Dundee came to an end uh, relatively soon because uh, uh, people wanted me to move to, to Liverpool, and that was actually an important step for me because the physiology department in Liverpool was quite a famous one. Uh, largely because two people who had held the George Holt uh, chair uh, earlier on, uh, one was particularly famous, was Charlie Sherrington, generally credited with creating the framework for how we think about the whole nervous system. His famous book, The Integrative Action of the Nervous System, is still today by all neuroscientists regarded as a kind of foundation for modern neuroscience. And uh, this book was written during his years in Liverpool, uh, although he late in his life moved to Oxford uh, and uh, took the chair of physiology at the University of Oxford and received the Nobel Prize after arriving in Oxford. And many people, of course, forgot that the work was actually done at the University of Liverpool. And most people assumed that it was, of course, an achievement of the University of Oxford, but it was actually not the case. However, there's a counter to that. Uh, my laboratories in Liverpool were here in the basement, not particularly elegant laboratories, and these were laboratories that previously had belonged to the Department of Physics and had housed uh, the first cyclotron in the UK, which was built by James Chadwick, who came from Cambridge, took Liverpool to the chair of physics, and who luckily for the University of Liverpool received the Nobel Prize the year after he arrived in Liverpool, but of course for work he had done in Cambridge. So there you see, sometimes the university takes credit for something that actually happened in another university and sometimes it's the other way around. So anyway, it was a famous place, uh, not very elegant laboratories, but that's where we uh, started our work. However, my immediate predecessor, uh, Rod Gregory, was in the field of gastrointestinal physiology, which is, of course, my field and also Peter Hegge's field, of course, uh, was a very, very important person because he was the person who proved the existence of the hormone gastrin, which is one of the main stimulants of acid secretion, which up to his time, people had disputed that this hormone actually existed. But he proved it, and not only proved the existence of it, he also was the first who sequenced the peptide, and this was actually the first gastrointestinal hormone that was sequenced. So he became very famous. He was a fellow of the Royal Society and also a commander of the British Empire. And of course, at that point, I never expected that I would eventually uh, get exactly these same accolades uh, as he did. However, nevertheless, these uh, laboratories were somewhat unsatisfactory, and in 92 we moved to a new building uh, 
And here is a connection with Bert Sackman, who unfortunately can't be here today. But uh, I asked Bert whether he would be kind enough to come and open our new laboratory, which he did. And this is a picture from the university newspaper of uh, uh, Bert and me uh, unveiling the plaque that memorizes and still is there today, of course, in the physiology research building. Uh, so that was uh, a, a very nice event. And that's, uh, again, relevant in the general story because uh, at that time there happened a revolution in electrophysiology. Up to that point, uh, everybody had worked with these sharp microelectrodes that I mentioned before, and uh, we did not actually know the fundamental events that were underlying these electrical changes. And that required a completely new technology, which was invented by uh, Erwin Neer and Bert Sackmann, both people, of course, who have been and continue to be closely associated with the uh, Sacred Scientist uh, Academy. And of course, they got a Nobel Prize for this uh, very important discovery uh, already uh, very soon, actually, in Nobel Prize terms. They got it very early in, in, in 1991. So they published uh, their first paper, and this is actually a record from their 1976 paper in Nature, showing the first single channel recordings from a biological membrane. And that was when everybody understood that the events that happen in nerve and muscle cells, because I mean both Erwin and Bert are neuroscientists, and so everybody assumed that ion channels are really important for the nervous system, People did not necessarily think that ion channels even existed outside the neuromuscular system, but in the nervous system. And then I understood that actually there's a fundamental event. And you see here, this is how it happens. A channel opens, closes, opens, closes. And this is actually a stochastic process. So if you are watching the oscilloscope screen and you are at this point, nobody can predict exactly when the channel opens and when it closes. You can only talk about probabilities. If you have a long recording, you can talk about a certain open state probability, but you cannot predict exactly when it happens. It's a stochastic process. So the channel protein is a protein that constantly fluctuates into different configurations, and only some of the configurations correspond to an open state. Most of the configurations correspond to a closed state. So. Uh, so that was a very fundamental discovery. However, the technique in 1976 was not generally useful and was not generally applied. So that paper was a solitary paper in 1976, and for four years, nothing more happened, actually. It was a very, very difficult technique to apply. The seal between the glass pipette and the membrane was very bad, actually. It's a noise. It's very noisy recording, as you see. And some people tried, and they couldn't really make it work, actually. And it was only in 1980 when, actually, Irving Nea made the chance discovery of what became known as the Giga Seal. That is the extraordinary physical interaction that can happen between the glass pipette and the membrane. So you need to have a completely clean surface of the cell. You need to have a very smooth pipette, and you need to apply a bit of negative pressure. And then suddenly, you get a seal that is orders of magnitude better than what they had in 76, and suddenly in 1980, the technique was ready to be used by masses of people. And I had the very great luck to visit Göttingen in November uh, 1980, actually a few weeks after another Nature paper was uh, published by Erwin Neer. It was actually Erwin Neer who discovered the Giga Seal. Uh, and this was published by Sigwars and Nea in November 1980. And two weeks after, just by chance, I came to give a seminar in the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen and uh, saw everything. And there is another important lesson here that is a general one. Very often people think that if you make a really important discovery, uh, you should keep it a little bit to yourself initially, to give yourself a little bit of space to make all the possible discoveries you can with a new technique to get a lead and not let other people sort of start a competition too early. But uh, Erwin and Bert did exactly the opposite. They totally freely explained the technique. When I was there visiting in November, they generously showed me everything. They gave me the blueprint 
for producing the amplifier 780 because you could not buy an amplifier that could actually amplify these very, very tiny currents. You had to do it yourself, actually. And they generously showed everything. And they did that to everybody who visited, actually. And they even went further. So in 1982, they organized an EMBO course, uh, European Molecular Biology Organization course in Erich in Sicily, where lots of young people in the neuroscience field came and were shown directly, actually, how to do this. Luckily for me, I already had uh, done work on this because I had had this uh, luck of uh, going to Göttingen quite early in my life. So I actually uh, gave a talk at this a meeting, which was nice. And the book was published a year after. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, one of the chapters is uh, one of my presentations, actually, at, at that meeting. So they did a fantastic job, actually. And they were rewarded for that generosity because the whole of the particular neuroscience field changed their technique within a few years, actually. All the sharp microelectrodes disappeared, all the old amplifiers disappeared, and worldwide everybody saw this is, a, this is a moment to change the whole technology of electrophysiology. And so within a few years, uh, there was really something that you can only call a revolution. Uh, and they also published a very important paper in Flügers Archive, uh, an old German journal actually, which originally only published in German, but of course now published in English. And this paper, which many people do not think of it as a very important journal anymore, nevertheless this paper uh, became one of the most highly cited papers in biology. Cited probably now already 20,000 times, which is something unheard of for science. There are only a handful of papers that have ever been cited uh, to that extent. And the reason was that everybody could use the technique. So it was not only a discovery or something, it was something that actually was practical and, and, and you could do it actually. So when I came back in uh, 1980 from Göttingen, uh, I immediately understood that this was time for us also to, to retool. But uh, because of my move to Liverpool at that time, which was a bit unlucky actually, otherwise we would have been even earlier. But I had on the other hand the great luck of having a fantastic Japanese uh, co-worker again, Yoshi Mariyama, who was actually a medical uh, a doctor who had never done a single experiment in his life before he came to me. Uh, he had no training in electronics or anything like that, but he actually built our first patch climb amplifier. As I said, they only became commercially available uh, late 1982, so up to that point. And it was only from 83, 84 that many papers began to appear, actually. So still in 1982, you could count on your two hands the number of papers published in that field, and all of them were published in Nature. So this became the kind of patch clamp journal at, the, at that point. Anyway, Yoshu, who had no training in electronics, but I gave him all the drawings that Erwin and Bert had shown to me, and he built a patch clamp amplifier. And if we hadn't done that, uh, our first papers would have been probably 84 rather than 82. And this is actually his setup here. It's quite primitive by modern conditions. You need, of course, a very quiet uh, surface, and nowadays you have all sorts of elegant uh, uh, tables that uh, prevent any kind of uh, tremors from reaching your setup. But in those days, we had a very simple system. We had a solid wooden table. We had uh, foam here, and we had a heavy plate there, and that actually worked uh, quite well. And with his home-made amplifier, we could make the first uh, recordings of uh, single channels. And these were actually the first recordings outside the system of uh, the nerves and muscle system. There had never been uh, any single channel recordings from epithelial cells. And up to that point, actually, people were not really sure whether there were ion channels in the epithelial cells. So uh, when I remember I congratulated uh, Bert and Erwin on the Nobel Prize in 91, and I have a very nice letter from Bert, actually, who said that for him it was really reassuring to see that these ion channels also existed outside the nervous system that actually the method had applicability because they actually only thought that this, and of course neuroscience is a huge field and fantastically important in its own right, but they had not actually thought that this could also be important uh, outside that area. <clears throat> 
So the most important channel we found was a little bit later was uh, this uh, discovery of the calcium and voltage activated potassium channel, uh, which was a very big surprise actually, because the general notion was that even if ion channels existed in epithelial cells, these cells would not be electrically excitable uh, because they did not conduct action potential like nerve cells and muscle cells did. So why did they need to have ion channels that were sensitive to the electrical membrane potential? But they did actually. And so here you see an example of a, a potassium channel and you can see that if you have at negative physiological potentials, there's very little opening. As you reduce the membrane potential and as you reverse the potential, the open state probability increases enormously. So this is an interesting channel because it's regulated by two things. And here these curves illustrate the result actually. It is regulated by membrane potential and it is regulated by the calcium concentration in contact with the inner aspect of the membrane. And you can see here these two, this is all from one and the same bit of membrane sitting here at the tip of a pipette. So we can change the solutions on each side of the, of, of the membrane as we want. And so in this row here, we have a very low calcium concentration, 10 to minus 8 molar. And here we have 10 times higher calcium concentration. And particularly if you look at the negative membrane potential, which are the physiological ones, then you can see that when you increase the calcium concentration at, for example, minus 30 millivolts, the channel is almost completely closed at a very low calcium concentration, but you increase the calcium concentration tenfold and the open state probability increases enormously. And so you generate all these curves at different calcium concentrations. And by comparing this family of curves in what we call the excised patch, that's a completely isolated bit of membrane, from the recordings that you make in the intact cell, we could generate, so this is a curve for the intact cell. And you see it sits exactly between the curves in the excised membrane between 10 to minus 7 and 10 to minus 8. So we reasoned that the normal calcium concentration inside the cell must be somewhere between 10 to minus 8 and 10 to minus 7 molar and was actually the first really reliable measurement of the free ionized calcium concentration in epithelial cells. And indeed, I mean, this has turned out to be a, a, a correct value. Another aspect which actually originally had not been thought to be very important for the patch clamp technique was the so-called whole cell recording. You could actually also uh, make a recording like that where you make a hole into the cell and you have one single cell sitting at the end of a pipette and then you can record the whole assemble of all the currents in the cell at the same time. And if one channel is completely dominant in the cell or if you have blocked all the other channels pharmacologically, by combining recording of single channels and the whole cell recordings, you can actually quantify the number of channels in the cell. So you have this very simple formula that the number of channels in a cell is equal to the whole cell current divided by the single channel current multiplied by the open state probability. And you can see it makes sense because if you make the open state probability one, which means that the channel is open all the time, then clearly if you divide the whole cell current by the single channel current, you get the number of channels. And so for this channel, and it was a bit of a surprise at the time actually, that the number of channels is very small. This is a big channel and there are actually only about 50 to 100 channels of this type in one cell. A very small number, if you compare that with the number of receptors for neurotransmitters or hormones in the cell, which are sort of something like 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, it's very small. Some channels, of course, have much larger numbers and much lower conductances. But this is a really big channel and uh, it exists in very small numbers. So at that point, and that's something I could have done earlier, but somehow these uh, new findings stimulated me to think a little bit about the problem that still had not been solved at that problem. How is the fluid secretion actually initiated? And I recollected some data that I had published in 1970, but somehow not really understood at that time. 
So I did some very simple experiments, and which were published in the Journal of Physiology in 1970, where I simply measured potassium in the venous outflow from an isolated salivary gland, and found that when you stimulate with acetylcholine, the gland releases potassium, and you see a marked rise in the potassium concentration in the venous outflow from the gland. And that is followed immediately by a reuptake of potassium into the gland, so that the potassium concentration falls below the level in the arterial inflow. So what actually happens is that you're releasing potassium because you're opening potassium channels in the membrane. Potassium leaves the cell, and then the cell takes up the potassium again. However, the interesting finding that I had made, but somehow not fully thought about, was that if you remove external chloride from the solution, this potassium reuptake stops instantly. And in the moment when you re-emit chloride, you see immediately start taking your potassium. What I actually had discovered at that point, because exactly the same was seen with sodium. If I removed sodium, that also happened. And what I actually had discovered in 1970, but unfortunately for me, never made explicit, I had actually discovered an important transport protein, namely the so-called sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. I never used that word, but that was actually what I had discovered, and if I had had that in the title, that paper would probably have been a very highly cited paper, but the paper had a kind of convoluted uh, title about some studies about potassium movements in gland cells, and nobody paid much attention to it. Uh, and even I myself did not pay much attention to it until here, when I was invited to write a review article for Nature uh, after all these patch line papers. And then I started thinking carefully about this again. And then I suddenly realized the connection, actually, between the opening of the potassium channels and secretion. Because, of course, it's not very obvious why should opening of potassium channels stimulate secretion. It seems that you're just throwing out ions in the opposite direction of where secretion should occur. But actually, this opening of the potassium channels allows the recirculation of potassium that is essential for the operation of this transporter. Later on, we realized that the situation was more complicated and we produced a complete model of secretion, which is actually the model that uh, today is generally acknowledged. So you open potassium channel in the basolateral membrane and you can run all these processes here, the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter, the sodium pump, so potassium and sodium recirculate, and the net result is chloride uptake. And then you need to get chloride out into the lumen, and that happens through these chloride channels that are explicitly and exclusively sitting here in the apical membrane. And sodium actually does not move through the cell, it moves between the cells in the paracellular pathway, attracted by the negativity in, in the lumen and water flows, both paracellularly and through the axonal cells, whose special water channels, aquaporins, for which a Nobel Prize was given uh, many years later. So that uh, was actually uh, a nice result, because in many ways, that was my ambition as a medical student to understand how fluid secretion is uh, initiated. So by 1984, and uh, that paper finally actually did become quite highly cited. And in 93, it was named as a web of science uh, citation classic. So the patch climb technique uh, initiated uh, all of these things. And uh, uh, to this day, I have to be very grateful to Yoshio Mariyama, who really was in brilliant uh, ex experimenter. Now, of course, the next question was, what do these calcium signals actually look like that physiologically activate secretion? Because clearly it became clear that this is the initial step, actually. And uh, that was another surprise. Up to that point, most people had thought that when you stimulate the cells, the calcium concentration goes up and stays up as long as secretion has to be maintained, and then when you stop secretion, the calcium concentration probably falls. However, as we discovered, that's not the case. The calcium signals are intermittent, very short-lasting spikes, and the calcium concentration is localized. So this uh, discovery of local calcium spiking uh, was really quite important. It had been realized again in the nervous system well before because uh, for 
all sorts of reasons, again, early 90s. All this happens actually at the same time in different cell types. Uh, Rudolfo Linas in, in, in New York realized that neurotransmitter secretion must occur as a result of a localizing calcium in the presynaptic terminals. Uh, and what is also a very interesting general lesson, again, is that sometimes the same discoveries are made exactly at the same time by different people, even very far away. And this is a typical example of that. Unknown to me, while we were doing these experiments in 91, 92, exactly the same things were being pursued very far away at the University of Tokyo uh, by Haru Kasai, who you see down here. And you see here uh, the result from these two papers, which were actually published back to back in the same issue of Cell in, in, in 93. Uh, I discovered that I visited Tokyo in 92 and gave a seminar at the University of Tokyo and I met Haru Kasai at that point. And then after my seminar where I talked about these data, he invited me to his lab and, and showed me these data, exactly very, very similar to our data. And we both discovered that we were both fighting with the editors of Cell to get this paper accepted there. In the Cell, uh, is extreme, like Nature, extremely competitive journal, and so it's really difficult to get your papers into there. So what almost happens is that it's always rejected initially, and then you have to fight back and say, you know, it's a really important paper, and you argue with the referees and so on. And both he and I were actually at that point in 92 uh, fighting with the uh, editors and referees of Cell to get that paper in. And I think we were lucky, actually, that both these papers were actually submitted uh, very close. I think Haru's paper was submitted a few days just by accident after I submitted our paper. And uh, I think because it was two findings made in two very different places, probably convinced the editors of Cell that maybe it was important after all. And finally, they, they, they were accepted, actually. And uh, later on, I had a nice collaboration with Haru Kasai in writing a review in uh, annual review of physiology, which also became uh, uh, quite highly cited. Uh, so th th that was quite nice. Haru Kasai actually is also a neuroscientist, basically, but for some years he worked on the pancreas and produced some uh, really nice papers. Uh, now he's again actually a very well known uh, neuroscientist uh, still uh, at the University of Tokyo. However, we realized that these cells have the capacity both to produce local signals and global signals. And it became clear also, and I don't have time to go into all the details here, otherwise we would be here all night, uh, that these global signals are actually pathological. So the local signals are the healthy signals that control normal secretion. But if you either stimulate excessively, or if you destroy the function of the mitochondria, which are sitting here just on the border between the granular area where all the enzymes are packaged and the rest of the cell. If you destroy the membrane potential across the inner mitochondrial membrane by an ionophore, then the cell cannot produce these local calcium signals anymore. They spread out. And this was a discovery made by a very good postdoc who came to me from the Max Planck Institute in Dortmund in Germany. And she discovered both these remarkable distribution of mitochondria in the ASNA cells. The mitochondria you see here, this is live microscopy and fluorescent probe that marks mitochondria sitting exactly surrounding the granular area and subdividing the cell into these two parts. So this is pathology and this is physiology. Now, meanwhile, I, I moved on again, uh, this time to uh, Cardiff University, as uh, Peter Hege mentioned. In fact, I was about to retire in, in, in physiology, that's uh, how old I am. And uh, one day I get a phone call from headhunters who sort of ask me about my advice about who might, uh, sorry, uh, succeed uh, Sir Martin Evans, uh, who was the director of the School of Bioscience in Cardiff and who won the Nobel Prize in 2007 for the discovery of stem cells. And so we discussed with the headhunters, and then almost like a joke, I said, well, maybe I uh, might come to Cardiff. And uh, that is actually what happened. So I succeeded uh, Sir Martin, <clears throat> and in 2013, uh, three years after I came there, we opened uh, this new uh, building uh, uh, and was named after uh, Sir Martin. So this started then a, 
uh, a new uh, chapter. By that time, uh, pathophysiology had become almost completely dominant uh, in, in my life. I had the further luck in 2010 to be elected a member of the German National Academy of Sciences, uh, which actually is even older than the Royal Society. Actually, it was founded in 1652. Uh, and uh, they have this uh, fantastic building here in, in, in Halle, in the former East Germany, uh, which was a present from the German government uh, to the Leopoldina. Germany, of course, because of its history, has a very large number of different science academies. But uh, in, uh, I think it was probably 2009 or something like that, that the German government decided that Germany as a whole needed to have a national academy. And there was actually a competition between all the regional academies in Germany about which academy should become the national academy. And the Leopoldina Academy won the competition. And so the Leopoldina Academy is now the national academy of, 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 of Germany. And uh, some years later, in 2012, I had the honor of giving the Leopoldina lecture. Uh, and because I had one, gone to school in Germany for a couple of years, I uh, do speak German, and so I gave actually my lecture in, 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 in German about how the pancreas can be destroyed by alcohol. Uh, and uh, we had a very nice uh, talk about that uh, this morning from a student of Peter Hecke and uh, Dr. Wengelovic about alcohol and acute uh, pancreatitis. So, at that point, I felt that we had gained a lot of knowledge about the normal physiology of how the pancreas worked, and that maybe it was time to use that knowledge also to gain some practical advantage. Maybe we could find something that could actually uh, cure uh, this disease. And uh, so just focus a bit on the alcohol-related pancreatitis. So pancreas is a really uh, dangerous organ that we all walk around with because it's an organ, of course, that produces all the enzymes that we need to digest the food that we eat. And of course, the food that we eat are cells from plants or from animals. And this means that these enzymes that can break down the food that we eat also, of course, has the capacity to digest our own cells. And uh, that is actually what happens in acute pancreatitis. So this is why I say it's a very dangerous organ we uh, walk around with because we had this fantastic concentration of uh, enzymes that are produced in the pancreas. So it's a really bulk production of, of proteases. And uh, they should, of course, normally, and in normal physiology, these enzymes are not active enzymes inside the gland cells. They only become activated when they are secreted into the gut. So they are secreted as pro-enzymes and only become real active enzymes in the gut when they start working. However, in this disease, acute pancreatitis, they become activated inside the cells and they start digesting the cells and the cells will uh, eventually go into necrosis. And this will trigger a gigantic inflammatory response with moving in our masses of immune cells. And that causes the disease, acute pancreatitis. And uh, as we heard this morning, in acute cases, this uh, has a very considerable uh, fatality. And of course, uh, all the work done by Peter Hickey's group here in, uh, in SECIT, of course, has also uh, provided a lot of uh, evidence uh, about how uh, this disease is progressed, and there are very many different targets. Anyway, uh, of course, by, as being a calcium person, my focus was on, 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 on calcium. And uh, this is just the general model. So in the normal history of stimulus secretion coupling, as I mentioned already, we usually have the initial signal releasing calcium from internal stores, and that in turn will open up these channels, which are also known as calcium release activated calcium channels. It turns out that what happens in pancreatitis is that you utilize exactly the same system, but you just get a too strong response. So you actually open these channels to a uh, unphysiological extent, so you are getting a massive release of calcium from the internal stores, much bigger than you would normally and therefore you trigger a much bigger, a much larger number of openings of these calcium release activated calcium channels. So you flood the cells with calcium, what we call calcium overload, uh, 
And this has a number of very nasty consequences. Something happens to the granules in which these proenzymes are stored so that they become vacuoles and you actually get free active proteases released into the uh, cytosol. Some of the vacuoles are also exocytosed, so you also get free enzymes in the immediate surroundings of the ACE cell. So you get a kind of double attack of the cell. You get proteases acting from inside the cell and also from outside the cell. The other nasty consequences is that the calcium overload is very dangerous for the mitochondria. So the mitochondria are normally stimulated a bit by a bit of calcium going into the mitochondria. And that actually is physiologically very important because that's how metabolism is increased when we start secreting. So uh, the calcium uptake in the mitochondria is a real physiological significance. However, if there is too much uptake of calcium into the mitochondria, this is very bad because you activate a special channel, a very large channel called the membrane permeability pore, and that collapses the membrane potential across the mitochondria. And that membrane potential is absolutely vital for ATP production, for energy production. So the mitochondria cannot produce energy. And that means, of course, that ATP goes down. And when you have no ATP, uh, you can't secrete normally. So you have a secretion defect, which is a classical defect in acute pancreatitis. But more importantly, when the cell dies, if there's no ATP, the only way the cell can die is in necrosis rather than apoptosis. The apoptosis is a peaceful cell death, which is not necessarily dangerous in itself if the cells can divide, which the pancreas can. Of course, in the brain it's different because if you have apoptosis, you can't replace the brain cells. But in peripheral organs, like in liver and pancreas, it's not a problem apoptosis. You just uh, regenerate the cells. But if there's no ATP, you can't die by apoptosis. You can only die by necrosis. And that is a kind of explosive death where the cell disintegrates completely, releasing its internal components into the interstitial fluid. And that is, as I mentioned, triggering this fantastic immune response, which is really dangerous. So that's the sort of uh, model we have. And so you obviously think about how could you prevent this massive calcium release. And uh, one finding that we had made many years earlier uh, came to mind. And uh, that's maybe a little bit amusing. Coffee drinking actually can be helpful. So we had discovered in 1990 in another paper published in Cell that uh, caffeine abolishes these short-lasting calcium spikes, uh, which here are recorded just electrophysiologically. Uh, caffeine is a substance that is fantastically cell permeable. Caffeine walks across cells. Uh, without any hindrance, actually. Uh, this is one of the most membrane permeable uh, substances that you can know. So uh, you can just add caffeine outside the cell and it will be inside instantly. So, in fact, it turns out that yes, caffeine is a inhibitor of this uh, calcium release channel that sits in the endoplasmic reticulum which is also a receptor for a messenger called inositol trisphosphate, which is a messenger which is produced inside the cells when neurotransmitters uh, activate the cells. And caffeine actually uh, basically blocks opening of this channel. So it works actually, and in a paper published uh, much more recently uh, by the Liverpool group, uh, just show one parameter, so this is in vivo in mice. Uh, and you see that if you create pancreatitis by combining alcohol and fatty acids, which produce these fatty acid acyl esters inside the cell, you get a market elevation of pancreatic enzymes in the plasma. In this case, uh, just uh, show amylase as one marker of proteases you have here. But if you have injected caffeine or allowed them to drink solution with a very high content of caffeine, you will largely prevent that rise. So caffeine actually can be uh, a good agent, and there is actually evidence from clinical trials that uh, caffeine is somewhat protective. 
uh, against uh, alcohol-related pancreatitis. However, one has to immediately say it is not actually going to be a major therapy because caffeine not only inhibits these channels, it also activates other calcium release channels, particularly in the heart, and so there's a big danger of uh, arrhythmias from, from the heart, and the concentrations of caffeine you need in order to inhibit that channel are quite high. So it means that while it could potentially help some people, there would be a big danger if you applied it more generally that you just uh, uh, engender some uh, very big disasters uh, in, in, in the heart. So it's a more curiosity here, but nevertheless, uh, one could argue that maybe there is some merit in the kind of classical habit that after a big dinner with alcohol and fat and so on, you have coffee at the end of the meal, and maybe that can be a justification for this habit. What is a little bit more realistic uh, is something else. Uh, we realize that although the initial event in this calcium overload is due to release of calcium from internal stores, this, of course, is only a finite amount of calcium that is released. And we have, of course, calcium pumps sitting in the cell membrane that will export the calcium. So you will not actually endanger a really dangerous situation unless you have calcium flowing in through these calcium or these activated calcium channels. Because this will only give a transient rise and in order to have a sustained elevation, you need calcium to come in all the time. So the idea would then be that why don't we think about blocking this channel? And actually that works. And so the kind of model uh, is one you see here. When you release calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum, there is a molecule, a stim molecule, that changes its configuration so that it can interact with these calcium release activated calcium channels, also known as ORI1 uh, channels. And when they link up these two elements, the channels open and they really open and you get a massive inflow of calcium into the cell and that creates this calcium overflow which will kill the cell. So in uh, 2013 we published this paper which uh, based on uh, experiments on uh, isolated cells indicated that there is actually a particular type of inhibitor of these channels that will work and it will inhibit the calcium rise and most importantly as you can see here it will dramatically reduce the protease activation inside the cells and also dramatically reduce the state of necrosis. So this is what you may call a kind of proof of principle that it might work and uh, at the moment actually uh, an RI1 channel inhibitor, crack inhibitor, is undergoing uh, clinical trials in, in, in the US and is at the moment in, in, in phase two. So this is possible, one possible uh, outcome of this that we may finally have a, shall we say, a rational treatment of acute pancreatitis because at the moment there is not a uh, really uh, a rational treatment of this disease. However, this uh, <coughs> leads me straight to my final point uh, of, of my talk, namely that ultimately, of course, uh, if findings are going to be useful in the clinic, of course, uh, you have to do clinical trials, of course, and uh, that is going to be the next point. But meanwhile, I just uh, want to make another point. You will have seen throughout my talk that uh, I have collaborated with scientists from many different countries. For many years, my laboratory was generally thought of as being a Japanese laboratory because I had very many people from Japan coming to my laboratory. Then it became a Ukrainian laboratory because when sort of conditions in the former Soviet Union collapsed, many people who were very well trained and very well educated fled to the West. And so for many years, my laboratory was largely a Ukrainian laboratory. Uh, but uh, at some point, of course, uh, China became uh, clearly uh, 
very visible on the horizon. And so in later years, I established a number of uh, contacts uh, in, in, in China, and particularly with uh, Yinan University in, 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 in Guangzhou. And the best outcome of that contact was actually, and this is my sort of latest PhD student. I started with my early PhD student in Dundee, and uh, so this is my latest PhD student, Xiong Peng, who graduated as a PhD from Cardiff University uh, last year. And uh, Peter Hecke already referred to this uh, paper in his introduction, uh, because we began to realize that while calcium, of course, is fantastically important in the pancreas, uh, it could also, to some extent, be seen as a metabolic disease. It turns out now, in general, I mean, metabolism has emerged in recent years as a really big issue in, 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 in physiology and also in, in, in clinical science. In so many different diseases, it turns out that metabolism is changed in, in, in one way or the, or, or the other. So also metabolomics has become sort of really a big science now. And uh, we made the very, uh, Shuang made the very surprising observation that while in uh, healthy cells, obviously, if you maintain cells in the absence of glucose in the medium, they really suffer. I mean, your cells need energy. And so in our solutions, when we work with isolated cells, we need to have sugar there. But if you treat cells with agents that induce a state of acute pancreatitis in the cells, we turned out that it makes no difference whatsoever whether you have glucose there or not. It was a very surprising observation. We thought maybe things would be even worse and they would uh, collapse even sooner, actually. But it made no difference whether glucose was present or not. So it looked like in acute pancreatitis, actually, normal uh, glucose metabolism did not work, actually. And we still, I can't say that we fully understand uh, why that is the case. But that gave us the idea that maybe, if that is the case, you could bypass this initial step of glucose metabolism, because the initial state is, of course, this phosphorylation of glucose, the glucose 6-phosphate. And uh, galactose, which is also known as milk sugar, the sugar that is in, in mother's milk, uh, is an agent that is taken up by the same transporters that also transport glucose. But unlike glucose, uh, it can be dealt with in a completely different way. So it is phosphorylated on the one position rather than the six position. And then later on, galactose one formase can be transformed into one uh, glucose phosphate, which then again can be changed back to glucose 6-phosphate. So you have this pathway. It is known by some biochemists as the Le Loire pathway, discovered many years ago by a French biochemist and largely ignored by most people. But uh, we found this and uh, we thought, okay, thought it was a bit of a long shot, but maybe it might work actually. And amazingly, it, it, it did work. Uh, it turned out that the reduction in ATP levels that you get with all agents that induce a pancreatitis, whether it is alcohol and fatty acids, bile acids, or other agents, all these reductions in ATP could be counteracted by galactose. So it actually seemed that galactose could be metabolized, kept up. And of course, when you have ATP inside the cell, you diminish the calcium overload because the calcium pumps have ATP. They can get rid of, uh, of, of, of calcium. And the amazing thing was that it really uh, has an amazing degree of protection. And we did also in this paper, which was published last year, also do in vivo experiments and induced experimental pancreatitis in living mice. And we showed again that if these mice were drinking galactose and so on, there was a really remarkably impressive uh, protection uh, against, uh, against this. So then you would think, ah, so we should just drink lots of milk, then we will be uh, protected against uh, pancreatitis. Unfortunately, the milk that we drink is, of course, cow's milk, which contains very little galactose. But human milk contains a lot of galactose. 
So uh, actually the first idea, just to drink a lot of cow milk, will not actually help very much in, in, in protection and, and why that is so, but there are these very interesting species differences. In any case, I think this finding also fortifies an idea that uh, Peter Hege had totally independently, namely that metabolism is really important and that the general advice which is generally uh, followed uh, until recently in most clinics was that if a patient comes in with acute pancreatitis, they should not be given anything to eat actually, because the idea would be that it's bad to challenge the pancreas, it's already in a challenging situation, and of course if you eat, you will stimulate pancreatic secretion and so on, so this would be a bad thing. And uh, Peter also had this idea, this might not be uh, right actually, and it turns out that it's actually wrong, because it's actually really important to keep up the uh, ATP levels. And this uh, brings me then to my sort of final point, and this is one of the clinical, many clinical trials that uh, Peter has initiated in, 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 in PAGE, uh, and it has been very nice for me to be, I have to say, very peripherally involved in this because I really have done very little, uh, but uh, Peter has always very generously wanted to include me uh, in, in these papers, and uh, it's a pleasure to see how these uh, fantastic uh, numbers of uh, trial protocols are now be be being published uh, very, very rapidly. And indeed, this is a, a picture which Peter also showed from the review that we wrote together uh, and published in 2013, which was a really nice uh, collaboration where we tried to put together all the many different... I've only talked about a very limited aspect of what happens in the ASNA cells. Peter has always made a very valid point, which is important that duct cells are as important uh, in this whole process as the axonal cells, which is correct. And in this review, we tried to uh, put all of this uh, together. So that was a, a really uh, a nice collaboration, which, which I, I, I hope will still uh, continue. And I hope also one day to persuade Peter to do a, a clinical trial with the galactose. This would be uh, another interesting step uh, to continue this. And my very final slide uh, is just to say a little bit about uh, science as an international activity. Again, this is just where I have mostly been. So the size of these asterisks indicates the number in a rough kind of semi quantitative way, the number of invited talks I've given in different parts of the world. But they also create a kind of map about where science is most active in the world. Although, of course, every scientist will have a slightly different map, obviously. But there are certain things that, that are very common. And one thing, of course, that is immediately noticeable is that, yes, science is a very international activity, but there are very large parts of the world that basically hardly participate in this activity at all. It's very much an activity that occurs in Europe, in, the, in North America, and in a certain corner of, of, of the Far East. And in the rest of the world, uh, there is a bit of sporadic science here and there, but, but, but very, very little actually. And that is, in a way, uh, our loss, because it means that a lot of talent that exists in many parts of the world actually uh, will, will not be, be, be utilized. So I've talked mostly about uh, collaborations within Europe and with, uh, with the Far East, but that should not take away from what everybody obviously has to be aware of, that still at this point in time and for many, many years to come, uh, the US is, of course, uh, unquestionably a very major producer of uh, the uh, high quality science uh, and this uh, is a development that really took off after the second world war to some extent really a collapse of what i said of german science actually the exodus of uh, very many excellent scientists to the u.s and again shows how political developments can actually also direct uh, science developments so it's a uh, it's still today and even with the rise of China, for probably most of you in your lifetime, the U.S. will still be a, a dominant uh, force in, in, in science. It will decline as an economic power and as a political power, 
But science very often kind of lags behind other developments. And the UK is a good example of that, actually. The UK is now a very minor power, not a great economic power, not a big political power. But the UK is still a very strong science power, surprisingly enough for many people, in spite of rather little investment over many years. The UK is still actually in the life sciences, unquestionably the number two country in the world, uh, in science output, which still, to many people, even to me, is still a surprise, actually, how, how that still continues. It shows that certain traditions continue much longer after the nation has, in a way, declined already. And for that reason, I would predict that even with the rise of China, the US, even though its political and probably even military power will drop over the next 50 years, but the science will still continue to be very strong for a very, very uh, long time. And finally, just to say a little bit about other activities, as Peter already hinted at, uh, although I'm still an active scientist, I have also uh, taken on very many other activities. And the world of publishing is now really changing uh, quite dramatically. Uh, in Europe, uh, more so actually than in other parts, but the European Commission has made it its aim that all science should be totally open access. So everybody who is supported by the European Commission, the European Research Council will from uh, 2021, they will be mandated to publish in, not only that their own papers have to be open access, but they have to publish in full open access journals. And one of the main ideas of the European Commission, uh, which I'm a bit involved in as, as an advisor, is actually to smash, to some extent, the power of journals like Nature and Cell, who have become too dominant in science and where people have to fight to get in there. And they make, of course, huge profits. They are profit-making organizations. And actually, scientific publishing is one of the most profitable businesses that exist, actually, with huge profit margins. So uh, many uh, societies, and uh, the American Physiological Society, which is by far the biggest physiological society in the world, with more than 10,000 members, uh, have decided to create a new journal, uh, which name of Function, which will be launched next year. And, and, and this year I was appointed editor-in-chief of this journal, and I'm now in the process of assembling an all board, and of course I asked Peter Heckey to be a member of, of, of the board. And so from next year we will have, hopefully, a journal that will become a high-profile journal in physiology, but will be a total uh, non-profit uh, open access journal. And I think this is now, most people think, the way that all scientific publishing will go, but there is still uh, an interesting transition period. And of course the commercial publishers have all sorts of uh, ideas about how to preserve their, uh, their, their power. And uh, with that, I will conclude my lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I hope that at least some parts of what I said was of some interest for you. <laughs>